to try and start on time. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Sawsville. I'm with Vermont Coverts Woodlands for Wildlife. And uh, we welcome you to this uh, presentation on Leave it to Beaver. Uh, and we have Kim Royer with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife here uh, to share with us about beaver here in Vermont. And um, I'm still admitting people, so just give me a second. And um, we're really excited to have her. We ask that you all mute yourselves so that we don't hear the background noise during the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and I'll relay them to Kim. Uh, just a quick note, uh, if you visit Vermont Covert's website, you can sign up for our e-news if you haven't already to be alerted to programs like this throughout uh, this whole uh, situation of most of us being home and do doing things online. There's a tremendous amount of information that's out there uh, that we're able to um, share and, and help and learn and grow together. So welcome everyone. Kim, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you get started. Great, thank you, Lisa. It's great to see some of the folks I haven't seen in a long time. Hi, Alan, good to see you. And uh, Tim and John, it's great uh, to have you all here. Uh, so we're here to talk about this amazing animal today, it, uh, the beaver. And if you have questions, like you said, put them in the chat box. Um, how come I'm not? Let me just. Oh, no, you're at the end, Kim. Yeah, I'm at the end. Okay. <laughs> what From happened? the beginning. From the yeah, beginning. Hang on. Let me end show and go back to the beginning. Okay, while we're doing that, um, uh, John asked if everybody could sort of put their town in the chat box. Where are people from who are on the call? Go ahead and type that in the chat box. Okay, there we go. Okay, now we're at the beginning. Uh, so we'll start here. Um, this is the animal we're here to talk about today, uh, the amazing beaver. And uh, most of you are probably familiar with this animal. It's one of the few animals in Vermont that we actually can see and know where to go to find it. Um, and beaver are rather clumsy on land. Um, they're big kind of round creatures. And so they don't travel very far from water. You'll find them maybe up to 100 feet, maybe 300 feet from the edge of water, but that's about as far as they go. Uh, they're very well known for the lodges, as in this photo, you can see this lodge here, and for cutting trees and for building dams. Um, and it's hard to believe that they have the smallest brain to body ratio of any mammal out there. So in other words, if they were the size that we are of a human, their brain would be 15 times smaller than ours. And yet I can't tell you how many times they have outsmarted us. Um, so pretty incredible animal. Um, and of course there is no other mammal really that can alter their landscape as much as the beaver can. Um, in water, uh, they turn into a different animal, basically. They're just very well adapted to water. They become this sleek torpedo-shaped animal with these incredibly large webbed hind feet that propel them through the water. Uh, they have that, that flattened tail, which most of you would be familiar with, that's, that, forms, that provides many functions. Um, it's it's uh, used to maneuver in the water. Uh, it actually provides stability on land when they're cutting down trees. Um, they, it signals alarm. Those of you who, who go to a beaver pond at dusk uh, may find that that beaver slaps its tail when it sees you. That's to signal alarm to other beaver. Uh, it's used for fat storage in the wintertime and actually for heat exchange. So really important uh, part of the beaver's anatomy. When a beaver dives, it actually has a nictitating membrane or what are like little goggles that cover its eye to protect its eyes. Uh, its nostril and ears will close up when they dive to, to prevent water from going into the mouth or the ears. Their lips are fur lined and they actually, a layer of air um, is, is under the fur. So when they dive, it helps to keep them warm. They have this incredibly efficient way of transferring oxygen. So they, they can actually exchange up to 75% of the air in their lungs as opposed to a human, which, which exchanges about 15%. And they can store large amounts of carbon dioxide so they can stay underwater about 15 minutes um, at a time, which you know, is, is amazing. Um, and they have these anal gland secretions 
uh, that that are provide sort of a territorial. They they build these these mounds, and any of you who have walked around a beaver wetland might find these mounds of muds, mud, and they'll secrete. Um, this this substance out of their anal glands that that actually uh, provides sort of a signal to other beaver outside of that particular family that this is our territory and you're not welcome here. So pretty lots of lots of adapt adaptations. Um, they're considered a keystone species, and if we were in a room together, I'd ask you what that means. Uh, many of you might know, but basically uh, they're an animal that creates habitat or many, many other animals. And a family of beaver can build a dam, a 35 foot dam in a week. Uh, and they create these amazing ponds similar to these here that provide habitat for a whole host of other species. Um, so you can see, you know, everything from uh, herps like reptiles and amphibians, invertebrates, uh, to everything up the food chain, waterfowl, moose, black bear, otter, muskrat, all of these animals uh, rely on beaver flowages for, for habitat, including, I would say, humans who enjoy uh, paddling in some of these flowages or fishing in some of these flowages. So there's a lot of functions and values besides habitat that are provided by these, by these wetlands. Um, they actually slow water down and therefore um, actually clean water before they go, it goes downstream. Uh, a lot of the sediment gets caught in the aquatic vegetation that's in the pond. So you have cleaner water downstream. They provide flood control. Um, we end up uh, having bacteria and phytoplankton in these wetlands that actually consume organic contaminants. Um, and inorganic, they make inorganic um, and inorganic contaminants as well. And um, with water flow through the beaver wetlands, it increases the, the pH of the water, it neutralizes the acids and, and increases the dissolved oxygen. So there's a lot of, lot of things that these wetlands do besides um, just providing habitat for wildlife that are beneficial to humans. Now this is a food cache here, you'll notice. And at the onset of the first frost, you'll, the, anybody who lives near a beaver wetland will notice an increase in beaver activity in the fall usually, and they're trying to build up their food reserves for the winter. Um, and what a beaver will do, what the beaver family will do is basically fill up, fill up, build up these reserves of food and then live under the ice all winter long. As long as they have enough food reserves, they will leave the lodge from under the ice and go to their food cache and, and eat what's available, what they've, what they've stored, and then go back to the lodge and live under the ice all year long, all winter long. If they're young, a young family, and there's not a lot of food available, their starvation is sometimes what happens if they don't have a large enough food cache. This is the typical interior of a lodge. My, my beaver technician at the time and I found uh, an area that had been abandoned and crawled into this lodge. And you can see on the right here, this is, um, a nesting, the nesting area where the young are born. Um, and basically in these lodges, there's usually two to five exit holes. And the average temperature in here is anywhere, usually between 33 and 35 degrees through the entire winter. So it stays relatively warm, even in below zero temperatures. And this is where um, the young are born, usually during ice breakup. And the young are born fully furred, uh, eyes open, teeth erupted. Uh, they, they stay in the lodge upwards of about two weeks, but they're able to swim almost immediately. And they start feeding on aquatic vegetation within uh, you know, four days to two weeks. Uh, so they're pretty much ready to go um, when they're born. Beaver ponds are cyclic, um, and many of you already probably know this. Uh, they're highly productive when the dam is first built, and uh, they just have this influx of invertebrates and uh, small aquatic organisms that actually create this very diverse food web. Uh, then eventually the beaver eat themselves out of house and home. 
they abandon the site. It can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Uh, they leave the site and eventually the, the dam sort of uh, deconstructs and, and the water goes out and you have this, this lovely meadow, which also provides habitat for many, many wildlife species. And this may, this may stay this, in this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, you know, habitat for maybe, maybe you know, 10 to 20 years. And then eventually as new vegetation comes back in again, beaver will return to the site and the whole process will start over again. Now, just a little bit of history, and those of you who've heard my fur bear talk have already sort of heard some of this, but prior to European settlement, probably about the time that Jesus walked the streets of Palestine, we had a Native American culture who by necessity lived sustainably on the landscape because they moved around so much. They weren't very tied to agriculture, uh, so they only took what they could carry on their backs um, or what they could wear or what they were eating at the time. But beaver was a very important food and clothing source for Native Americans at the time. And they were significant predators on beaver in Northern New England at the time. So Native Americans and the native wolf that was here were probably the two predators of beaver. Um, and of course, uh, we, we no longer have wolves. And our Native American population, although we still have a Native American population, uh, probably is not trapping at the level that they were back then. In Europe, the relationship between wildlife and, um, and, and humans was fairly different at the time. And they were very mobile and used wildlife as a form of monetary exchange. And so they would collect beaver and sable and squirrel and um, the Vikings would, and then they would trade them in England for the kinds of things that they needed, like wheat, honey, um, and cloth. And you can see this, this map just shows you how, how far and wide many of these people went. And you can imagine if you lived in Northern, N Northern England or Northern Germany or you know, Northern Europe, it was, it was chilly a lot of the year. And furs were a very important part of the wardrobe. They used furs for uh, clothing, but also for blankets, rugs, and curtains. Um, and so you can, you can see as an example, uh, many of the kings and dukes at the time owned as many as 20 or 30 garments each. And uh, to just give you an example of, oh, I guess you guys can see this, I can't, but, but uh, you know, there was a huge number of animals exchanged um, and bought and sold. Uh, especially just to, for clothing and um, other kinds of goods. So by the end of the 1300s, there was no regulation on how many animals could be taken at the time. And uh, fur, fur species, fur bearer species were, were pretty much extirpated from many parts of Europe by the end of the 1300s. And you would have thought that would have raised a red flag for, uh, for people in Europe at the time. It didn't really, they just, trappers just moved further into the Russian interior. And um, from July to September, 1384, 382,982 skins were imported from the Baltics at that time. A huge number for the numbers of people that lived at the time. Beaver were always in demand. Um, and I usually ask the question, why? Uh, what, you know, at, at this point, um, but they were, their fur was uniquely suited to what is called felting. And basically uh, they have these microscopic barbs in their under fur that, that allows, allows um, going through, a, if you go through a process to press the fur and create hats. And, and many, many people in Europe wore a beaver felt hat. And in fact, whoops, why is this not working? Yeah. In fact, Abe Lincoln's tall hat that he's very famous for, for is made out of beaver felt. Many uh, Western cowboy hats are also made out of beaver felt. And uh, this was a very important and significant part of the European economy at that time. They also utilized many parts of the beaver. They would eat the meat. They actually ate the tail during Lent because they, uh, it was scaled. They considered it to be uh, a, an exchange for fish. Um, and they were relatively easy to, uh, to catch because they were, 
they were in lodges um, that allowed and, and in, in wetlands that were allowed people to um, access them fairly easily. It would be hard to overstate the importance of, um, of the search for beaver and other fur bears in the development of this continent. And many of our East, East Coast cities were, were uh, fur trade centers way back. And people came to this country looking for resources and in particular um, beaver. And uh, the search for beaver basically um, established Europeans in, in this continent. So they came over here and they met this Native American culture that had not changed significantly since uh, back when, like I said, Jesus walked the streets of Palestine. And uh, these people, you know, these Europeans came and offered to exchange all these different items like guns and knives and, and cloth for beaver pelts. And I, many of you have probably heard me read this, but I'll read it again just, just to give you an idea of of how it was viewed. At the onset of the fur trade, 10 good beavers, adult winter prime northern hides that were stretched and cured, bought the Indians one gun. One good beaver bought variously half a pound of powder, four pounds of shot, a hatchet, eight jackknives, a half a pound of beads, a good coat, or a pound of tobacco. The beaver does everything perfectly well, an Indian trapper told a Jesuit priest in 1657. It makes kettles, hatchets, swords, knives, bread. In short, it makes everything. The English have no sense. They give us two knives for one beaver skin. So at first, this looked like a really great deal for the natives, but you guys all know what happened, the history of, of the interaction between Europeans and Native Americans. Disease was brought uh, to this continent. The Native Americans became more and more dependent on this fur trade. They did a lot of the, a lot of the initial trapping of beaver for that trade. And by the mid 1670s, so just remember mid 1670s, this is a hundred years before Vermont was even settled. A quarter of a million beaver had been shipped to London from the Connecticut River Valley alone and beaver had become scarce in the area. Um, so just a huge change in how the, the natives here viewed wildlife, they became a monetary item they became dependent on this trade as, as a disease swept through their population. And, um, you know, beaver basically declined drastically over a period of about 100 years. So like I said, the search for beaver drove the exploration of the new world. The people that went west on those original rag and trains followed the trails that had been laid out by trappers uh, going west in search of fur bearers and, and beaver in particular. And it's what's really amazing to me is that by that time that first wagon train went west on the Oregon Trail in the mid 1800s, they were not even going into a pristine landscape. Beaver had already um, been drastically reduced and almost declined in many, almost gone in many areas as a result of unregulated take and the habitat changes that occurred um, in the east as well, uh, when they shifted from forest to, um, to, to agriculture. So Vermont, like I said, was settled 100 years later than southern New England. Uh, we had only about 85,000 European-based settler, settlers in 1790 and 155,000 by 1800s. And that habitat shift that I talked about, we went from about 90 to 95% forest down to about 30 to 35% forest in about 50 years. So that also um, contributed to the decline, not only in beaver, but in many of our other wildlife species. And you can imagine, you lose a keystone species like beaver, you're gonna see a decline in many, many other wildlife populations. And many of these weren't even being tracked, obviously, in the 1700s, uh, but we can assume that, that we saw a decline in many of the reptiles and amphibians, a decline in many of the invertebrates that are associated with beaver, beaver ponds. We know otter declined, moose declined, black bear declined. Um, so all of those species were associated with these wetlands and may have declined as a result. And it's hard to believe that this could happen given the potential for beaver population growth. And this is just a schematic, but um, you'll see later when I show you what actually happened with 
the beaver population in Vermont, um, it's not too out of line. If you start with a family of six beaver, and this doesn't include mortality, but you could end up with over 600 beaver in about 10 years. That's how fast that population can, can take off. Uh, so as a result of the, the destruction of the, the habitat, and, and it started actually with a recognition that many of our streams uh, were in trouble, the, the fish, a fish commission was established in the late 1800s, and that eventually became the Fish and Game Commission in 1876, which was the precursor to the Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, the current Fish and Wildlife Department structure uh, was established in 1906, and then the first hunting and fishing license um, was established in 1908, and that was 50 cents. And uh, that, that, that actually was used to start the first recovery efforts um, and the first acquisitions of habitat. But then in 1937, sportsmen actually pushed for a tax on, on, hunting, on hunting equipment and, and ammunition called the Pittman-Robertson Fund. And that was used to match uh, license dollars and, um, and recovery efforts really began in earnest after that. Uh, and the mission of the department is the conservation of fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the people of Vermont based on the statute that you saw on the last slide. And this is, involves about 25,000 different species, including um, invertebrates, uh, bats, eagles, um, and many of the game species in, you're most familiar with. So those recovery efforts that were funded in part uh, by those funds I just talked about, but many partners also contributed to some of these. In 1878, actually white-tailed deer, if you can believe that, were, were brought in um, by the precursor to the Sportsman's Federation from New York. Uh, in 1956 in Addison, this is hard to believe also, uh, we had no nesting geese in Vermont at the time. And um, Professor Bob Fuller, who worked in Addison at the time, pinioned, uh, I think it was 44 pairs of geese, Lisa could correct me if I'm wrong, which established the first nesting population in Addison. Uh, in the 60s, fisher were brought back, and many of you know why. Uh, that was, they were brought back by the Forest and Parks Department uh, because of the concerns that they had of an increasing porcupine population. And they were paying a bounty on porcupines and decided it might be a good idea to bring back the, the predator of porcupines. And that was throughout the, the late 50s and the 60s. I think maybe 128 fisher, I think, were brought into Vermont. Um, Turkey in the 1960s and in 1989, 90, and 91, we brought back 115 or 16 Martin from New York and Maine in the Southern Greens in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service. And we thought that program had failed, um, but actually uh, in recent years, we've been doing a study with Central Connecticut State University. And uh, we're pretty excited that we actually have a small population in Southern Vermont. So hopefully that will continue. Beaver were brought back in. Uh, they were protected in 1910 by the department. In 1921 to 1937, uh, the department brought them back in from New York and Maine and relocated them into Vermont. Uh, they, in 1941, they actually surveyed the population and estimated there to be about 400 uh, animals in the state. They surveyed again three years later and that estimate had jumped to 1,100 animals and surveyed again um, in 1949 and estimated there to be upwards of 8,000 animals. That's how fast that population uh, increased. And it, that mimics that other chart I showed you. So uh, again, remember, no predators remained really, or very few predators remained in Vermont at that time. So that was a population that was growing uh, really without any predators on the landscape. So in 1950, as that population increased, there started to be an increase in complaints about beaver. The department established a 15-day trapping season and about 1,100 beaver were harvested um, in, in that year, 1950. So just to give you an example of how, how this might have happened, 
let's assume you you uh, established you release beaver in that watershed in this Maidstone watershed, which is about five square miles. You released a, a, a family group or a pair, say, in that area right uh, right there, and um, that population, as the two-year-olds at, at, in the spring of the year, when the two-year-olds uh, were ready to leave the lodge. You'd see them move maybe a half a mile or more up or downstream, find adequate habitat, and establish lodges in other locations where the water gradient was relatively low and move up and down the, the water system. And then you'd have the two-year-olds kicked out of there and up and down. You'd finally saturate that water system. And you might have Prior to European settlement, sorry, you might have had as many as 300 dams per square mile. You think about if each dam averaged about one acre, that's about half of the square mile might have been in some form of beaver created wetland. Now it could be those wetlands would blink in and out, just like I showed you, they're cyclic. So you might have some that had water in them and some that were just, um, just, just grasslands but they would blink in and out and um, you, you'd basically have a saturated beaver population where you had decent habitat. That would not be in steep areas or in mountain areas, but, but in those low gradient areas, we had very high densities of beaver population, we think, although we don't have a lot of information. Uh, this is mostly speculation. And so today, you know, we have a distribution of beaver that was similar to pre-European settlement, determined mostly by, by food availability and uh, water availability and the gradient of streams. Uh, they're generally not found north of tree line or in, in Florida, maybe because of um, alligator predation and or in the, in the arid uh, Southwest. So think about our road systems. Um, most of our road systems were constructed prior to the restoration of beaver. Um, you know, we have a pretty significant number of culverts and miles of roads in Vermont today. Um, and as the beaver population has been increasing, so have um, the conflicts between uh, beaver and humans. So we see an increased damage from, from flooding that occurs as, as the beaver population establishes dams um, in areas where there are already currently existing roads or driveways. So today the question is, you know, we have a pretty significant biological carrying capacity. In other words, if there were no human infrastructure, the state could probably support a lot of beaver. Um, but our cultural carrying capacity, given that we now have many roads, driveways, septic systems um, in areas where we may have once had beaver habitat, uh, we probably have what we call a cultural carrying capacity that is lower than our biological carrying capacity. And this is a challenge. And the only remaining predator we have today is, is humans um, and, and the regulated harvest of beaver to manage this population. Um, as I said, wolves are no longer in Vermont. Uh, we do think that coyotes may take some beaver, but probably not at the level that wolves used to take them. And of course, um, like I said, Native Americans used to depend heavily on beaver and uh, that's probably no longer the case. Um, so just a little example of a case study that, that was done as a result of a voter referendum that was passed in Massachusetts in 1996, just to, just to give you an example of what could happen to a beaver population when it isn't regulated or managed. And I'm sure this was promoted by very well-meaning people in Massachusetts. Um, management by the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife Department pre-voter referendum, they, they used education, provided guidance to landowners with beaver issues. Uh, they had significant, some, several research projects going on and they had regulated trapping where they actually um, were able to collect data based on harvest information and were monitoring the population that way. They assumed they were harvesting about 8% of beaver. 
which was maintaining the population at about between 25 and, and 30,000 animals. And then what was called question one passed and question one outlawed foothold traps, body gripping traps. It left uh, these, these cage traps, live restraining traps uh, legal, but these were relatively expensive and um, hard to maneuver traps. Actually, this Hancock trap here, a Bailey trap I've used, and it's, it's relatively dangerous uh, for a human. Um, the, the, the body gripping mouse trap was actually also uh, still allowed to be used. After question one passed in 1996, um, they harvested 1,100 beaver historically, um, and then the following season, that harvest dropped to 98 beaver, much, much lower levels, obviously. So you can see in this graph um, that they were maintaining the population at a, you know, between 25 and 30,000. Um, by 1999, they were up to about a 50,000 population, and by 2001, uh, had almost tripled to 70,000 beaver, which, you know, again, if there was no human infrastructure, this would not be an issue. Um, but because there is human infrastructure, uh, especially in Massachusetts, um, and that the harvest was no longer controlling the population and people started complaining, uh, the legislature gave municipalities the right to actually give out permits to harvest beaver. Um, but only after their damage had already occurred. And you can see from this graph, these red bars show the number of emergency per permits given out. Um, and you know, it started to get to the point where uh, the number of emergency permits given out actually was almost as high as animals being taken by uh, the regular harvest, which occurred during a season in which the beaver could be utilized. Many of these emergency permits were given out outside the season and the beaver end up being wasted. So more beaver after 96 were being taken as nuisance. 76% of the animals taken were taken under that emergency permit. Almost all of those were taken with the trap that had been outlawed. Um, and 54% 54, 54 were taken out of season um, and were wasted um, and not utilized. And again, all of those taken with the trap that had been outlawed. What really bothers me about this story is that um, they lost control over the protection of wetlands and, and many, many wetlands were destroyed as a result of the frustration that people had over not being able to control the population and or deal with the wetland problems. And you know, certainly there, is, there are people down in Massachusetts installing water control structures but um, that has not been able to alleviate all of these problems. So they, the state lost a valuable wildlife management tool. Um, there was no authority or access anymore for the state to get to the data on how many animals were being taken. They had to find other means to do so, which were much more costly. Uh, there was a high cost to towns and, and, and the public in that towns were then having to pay tens of thousands of dollars to, to address some of these problems. Again, the loss of wetlands, dams were breached with no permit or reporting requirements. Uh, they saw an increase in illegal activity. Um, the trap was banned for use by trappers during the regular season, but allowed uh, when it was a human safety risk and the carcasses ended up being wasted. Um, the banned trap was pro prohibited for fur harvested and for fur harvesters, um, and they were having to use uh, different types of traps. And um, the, this is what really bothers me the most is that instead of valuing this animal, which is an amazing animal, it became in many people's minds a pest. And that's one of the things that it's a challenge for our department is how do we maintain public support for these animals? And we find that people really support wildlife until the bear's on its back porch. Uh, the fisher is threatening its cat or small dog. You know, we have coyotes in the backyard. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden, people shift from valuing the animal to considering them pests. And and that's not where we want us. Our you know, we want our public to go. 
So we have a beaver management program that's been in effect for um, 20 years. Um, this is an effort to try to allow people to work with beaver. Um, we've, we, we wrote a, a best protocol, best management practices for resolving beaver human conflicts in Vermont 20 years ago. Um, and we install water control structures to try to minimize these conflicts between beaver and, and human infrastructure. And many of you maybe, maybe have, are familiar with these. Um, this, is a, this is one form of what we call a beaver baffle. You can see the holes in this pipe. Beaver respond to the sound of water. So we're just trying to fool them. And this structure goes in behind the dam. Uh, and those holes in the pipe actually uh, keep, the, when the water goes into the pipe, it's supposed to be minimizing the sound of the water as it, as it goes into this structure. I'll just show you how this, so this is uh, one of my beaver technicians, Brett, who's gone floating that pipe out into the pond. We've notched the dam here and we can, we can control the water level. And I say control very loosely because, uh, you know, these are not, these devices, you know, are not fine tuned. And so they don't address drought conditions or flooding conditions. But if we notch the dam a foot, we can lower the water level a foot. And um, this is what we're doing here is notching the dam down to the level that we want the pond to be at. We attach the flexible pipe to the baffle. And here where we're, we're, we're gonna put that, that pipe into the notch. You can see this right here. Uh, we're installing the, the, the pipe into the notch and the, the, the baffle itself is gonna be dropped into the pond in the back here. You can see it sinking there. We cover over the pipe with debris and then hopefully the beaver come back that night and fill that in and you can see that on the right side of the screen here. They pack it all in because they can hear the sound of the water running through here. So they patch this up and hopefully they don't figure out that it's going through the baffle 20 feet out in the pond. Sometimes they do, they outsmart us even with a brain 15 times smaller than ours. It's, it's humiliating. Um, and here you can see we, dr we dropped the water level a foot which pulled the water off the road um, and addressed the concerns of the town road crew. And that's really what we're trying to do is maintain this beaver flowage while addressing the concerns of the town or the private landowner. This is a round baffle, just a different type of baffle um, that we use quite often in larger water systems. These are culvert fences. Uh, you know, you, you may know that beaver often plug these culverts, uh, which actually then increases the, the height of the water and threatens town and, and, uh, and state road systems. If we put in these fences, Sometimes that prevents beaver from plugging the culverts. Sometimes they build a dam around this and then we can put a baffle through, uh, through that. So these are some examples of sites where we've done evaluations. Um, we've put in uh, upwards of 300 baffles over the last 20 years, uh, protected anywhere, somewhere around 3,300 acres of wetland. Um, of those, about 44% are still existing. These require some significant maintenance, and we try to do some maintenance on an annual basis, but we also usually hope the landowner will do some maintenance, and um, that may or may not occur. Uh, and if that doesn't occur, then um, often the baffles um, don't function any longer. Uh, they, they Sometimes we'll go back and replace the baffle, or if the water level is lowered too far and the beaver can't build a food cache and live under the ice, then the beaver may abandon the site. So we have to be really careful. Uh, we've removed about 49% where uh, they've outlived their, their need. Um, and then we have several that are existing but not functioning. So, like I said, we've almost put in 300 installations, um, 185 of those are baffles, 109 are culvert fences, and about 128 of those total are currently functioning. So this is just an example of how valuable those wetlands that are. This is one species that utilizes these, these wetlands. 
most of you know this is a great blue heron uh, that I think thinks he's gonna catch a fish, but he actually does and he picks up a stick instead. So, uh, and then this is a, this was a, one of our biologists put out a camera on a beaver dam and you can just see an example of some of the animals that have utilized that beaver dam. Um, the coyote, the coyote watching the waterfowl in the middle. Uh, many bobcats have, have been across the dam or on the ice. Turkeys, this is a gray fox. Just a whole host of wildlife species that utilize uh, these wetlands habitats. And so that's why we, we spend a significant amount of time and effort uh, trying to protect these habitats for, for the important values and functions that they provide to Vermonters and to the wildlife that are here. So just a little pitch if you know you want to support conservation in Vermont. We have a habitat stamp that's used to buy habitat in Vermont and the non-game wildlife fund, which goes towards many of our non-game wildlife species and functions as match for some federal pro federal monies that come in. So any questions? So there's one question that popped in uh, from Cherry. Cherry wants to know how long do beavers live on average? Oh, Cherry, what a great question. I would say um, in the wild, maybe upwards of 12, 12 years or so, um, anywhere from say 10 to 20 years. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see. Sure, so there is some concerns that the Massachusetts study might be a little bit uh, older. Are there any other recent studies about uh, the, the beaver um, and looking at numbers with human intervention or not human intervention? Uh, there is, well, I haven't, I haven't talked to the fur bearer biologist in Massachusetts about specific numbers. I, I can. Um, I think there's still the same situation has been has been occurring over the last 20 years or so, but um, that information came directly from them. Okay, great. Um, so there are some concerns about um, trapping doesn't really control the population that it might um, increase their numbers and reproduction. And uh, so just what are some thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think the way trapping can be utilized in Vermont, and I'm not speaking to Massachusetts, but the way we can utilize it in Vermont is where we have water control structures, um, sometimes controlling the population in those areas is another tool that may have to be used to prevent beaver from moving up or downstream and causing problems beyond that particular um, water watershed. So it is an important tool that we have to use sometimes in order to minimize beaver human conflicts in localized areas. Great, thanks. Um, Tim would like to know regarding water contamination downstream from the dam, how far down does a watershed do you have to go for like clean water to be potable, like if you're drinking? In terms of like, is he concerned about Giardia or, or? I believe so. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what we have found about Giardia, and I'm not suggesting that you, you drink water that comes from beaver flowage, although I have to tell you that for many, many years, uh, my water did come from a beaver flowage. Um, but G what we have found from about Giardia is I think often, wildlife get it from humans rather than the other way around. And um, I, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't really know how far down you'd have to go to be sure that you're not gonna, gonna get some disease from any kind of wildlife. Um, again, I, I don't recommend that you drink water out of a, you know, out of a beaver flowage directly. Um, just because I just don't know what's in it and I don't know how far down you'd have to go. The clean water I'm talking about is water that would be, that's clean for wildlife like fish and invertebrates. Um, beaver ponds tend to really help water downstream for, for wildlife species. 
And I guess I would also uh, say that that is what, what has historically been the case. I'm not sure how climate change will influence that. If we have beaver flowages where the water warms up too much as a result of climate change, we may see a decline in fish species and invertebrates downstream. That still remains to be seen. Okay. Um, Peter's wondering, uh, how have beavers affected surface topography or the geomorphology since the last ice age? Say that again, how or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how have beavers affected surface topography or the geomorphology since the last ice age? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure whether beavers have influence. I mean, if somebody has the answer to that, I'd be interested in that. I would say that the Ice Age has influenced where beavers will locate. So, you know, they prefer low gradient areas. And so if the Ice Age influenced uh, the, the geology, um, then that, you know, that's that, that the Ice Age actually influenced beaver population densities, I would say, rather than the other way around. But I could be wrong. I don't know the answer to that question, I don't think. All righty. Um, Gib wants to know, I have an abandoned beaver dam on my property. Is it likely that beavers might return to the dam and rebuild it? Yes. I, I mean, if you had a beaver dam on your property and it's historic, it's probably just going through that stage that I talked about where the beaver had eaten themselves out of house and home, left. And I suspect that when you have a food supply back there again, they'll be back. Um, and this is what's hard for people to realize is that, you know, these beaver flowages go through stages. So even if there's no water in that beaver flowage, it's still a beaver wetland. It's just a beaver wetland at a different stage. And it's okay. still providing great habitat. Great. Um, so uh, John wants to know, John Aberth wants to know if you're aware of the Quabbin Reservation and Sage Hen studies that show that beaver populations naturally regulate themselves going through up and down cycles. Um, not specifically, John. If you want to send that to me, that would be great. And I think that is true. They, they, to some degree, they will do that. Um, but it's the fact that there's there's a human infrastructure now overlaid on this landscape that makes um, it that 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 sort of imposes a cultural carrying capacity that that requires that some management occur. Management of some kind, whether it be trapping. Right partially necessary or a beaver baffle or something right. along those lines. That's right. I see. Um, Alan wants you to or know a combination that, of both. <laughs> okay. Um, Alan wants you to know that his, his beaver baffle is still working great and it makes for happy neighbors. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> glad, Alan. That's <laughs> terrific. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I suspect that Alan might be doing some maintenance on his baffle. Um, question from Josh. He says a beaver dam and lodge near his house was destroyed recently, presumably illegally. He says, where can I report this for investigation? Yeah, I would report it to the local warden and let him know and, and he, will, he will probably come look at it. it. I'm assuming this is on his property. It doesn't note whether it's on Josh's property or not. Um, but if it was on his property, then he certainly could go to the game board. What if it wasn't on his property? He, he should try to contact the landowner who's, well, it, I mean, I guess he's wondering if it's the landowner himself who. Oh, that could be. Okay. Yeah. Um, he can give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put Kim's email down in the bottom and you can coordinate that. Um, so Steve wants to know, what are the beaver's preferred tree species for food? Like, what do they like best? What, you know, least? Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad he asked that. Um, they, prefer, they prefer things like aspen and willow, especially small diameter aspen and willow. Uh, but you'll notice in a pond that they've been in, they've occupied for a long time, you know, you'll find them taking much larger trees and even at times softwood trees, uh, especially like pine. 
And that usually means that they're running low on, on food supplies. And they'll eat upwards of a pound to five and a half pounds of vegetation, woody vegetation a, a, a day in the wintertime. Um, and about, you know, a pound or 16 ounces of, of herbaceous vegetation in the summer. Great. Um, let's see. Just some other questions about recording it, which I answered. So yes, we are recording this and it will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, Kim, can you tell me a little bit, um, we talked the other day, um, so you know, I have a, a beaver dam that I'm aware of where it's really not coming back. And we talked about the softwoods kind of coming in and possibly influencing it, not returning there because its food source really isn't there. Um, is that is that probably, you know, happens elsewhere? You know, and is that one of the ways that a beaver meadow sort of fills in and doesn't reattract the beaver? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. So least yeah, like Lisa said, we mentioned we talked about this yesterday. Um, because beaver prefer what we call hardwood species or species like aspen, um, and 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 they 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 do not prefer the softwood species like spruce, fir, pine, hemlock. They actually the at uh, the edge of a pond will actually shift from hardwood to softwood sometimes when beaver occupy the site, and if that happens, it can take a long time for things like aspen and willow to creep back in along the edges of that pond. And until that happens, it's probably not gonna be a quality site for beaver. And that can take upwards of 10 to 20 years. Uh, and again, like I said, um, don't be discouraged. Though That site is still providing excellent wildlife habitat. It's just a different stage of wildlife habitat. And when the beaver come back, um, they are territorial, so that family group will protect its home range. It's not going to allow other beaver into the site. So I, I don't recommend that people move beaver around for, because if, if they move them into a site that's not occupied, chances are it's not good quality habitat yet. Mm -hmm. And if they move them into a site where they're already beaver existing, they're gonna get kicked out um, and they're gonna have to go up or downstream anyway because those, that family group is not going to allow an outside beaver into their, their pond. Great. All righty. Anything else you might want to add, Kim? Uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything else except that, you know, if you can tolerate this animal, it's a pretty amazing animal. And um, if you've got any conflicts, uh, give us a call. And Tyler does about, he gets about 400 calls a season. He's our beaver tech right now um, and he probably does upwards of 50 site visits to 100 site visits a year um, so he's happy to provide information and um, you know we'll try to resolve your your issues if we can with a water control structure because uh, our goal is to maintain these wetlands if we if we possibly can that sounds great all right kim well we thank you very much for joining us today and sharing us a little bit about beaver here in vermont thank you all for joining us today as well uh, as we noted this is being recorded and will be put up on our youtube channel uh, please sign up for our e-news so you can learn about other programs that are upcoming uh, on friday we have coffee with a climate change forester uh, that you can uh, our new ali kosaba is the new forester uh, here in vermont and um, so join us for that as well and um, you can also hit our donate buttons to help support programming like this as well. So we hope you all have a great day. Get outside and enjoy the day. And thank you again for joining us.